before we dive into the next phase of HTM theory, we're gonna have to put a new spin on things. So far, there have been two major discoveries in HTM theory. One is about sequence memory. You could say that the last 12 episodes have all been about sequence memory. Now, we're gonna talk about the second major discovery in HTM theory, the cortical circuitry of layers and columns. We've known about layers in the cortex for over 100 years. Here's Santiago Ramon y Cajal at his microscope. He created hundreds of beautiful illustrations of the brain, including this one displaying neocortical layers. In this episode, I'm going to define the structures of the cortex that enable intelligence. But first, a quick primer. If you remember from previous episodes, the HTM neuron has different integration zones that affect how it behaves. There are three zones we currently define in HTM, proximal, distal, and apical. Proximal input is feed forward or driver input because it tends to drive cell activations or action potentials. The distal and apical zones are modulatory zones, meaning they can affect how the neurons respond to proximal input under different contexts. Based on input received in these three integration zones, the neuron can become active or predictive. To make this all come together into a coherent theory, we're going to need to bring back the spinning brain. Remember when I told you that the neocortex is a homogeneous sheet? Well, there's a repeating structure in this sheet called a cortical column. You have hundreds of thousands of them in your brain, and they're all doing the same thing. Understanding this processing unit is crucial to understanding intelligence in the brain. Cortical columns have a laminar structure. Each layer is another modular processing unit. It contains thousands of pyramidal neurons, all oriented in the same way. The integration zones of the individual neurons also translate to the layer itself. In computing terms, each layer is a configurable compute module with different parameters and processing different input that might have come from other layers in the column or other parts of the brain. Looking back at the cortical sheet, different groups of cortical columns are dedicated to processing different sensory modalities like touch, sight, and hearing. Every cortical column in your brain contributes to object representation. As you observe a coffee cup with your fingers, cortical columns are processing your sensations over time. Each touch and movement helps to define the object feature by feature in space. As we move the object through our sensory field, many cortical columns processing sensory input represent the entire object from different perspectives. Now when you think of a coffee cup, Neurons representing that idea activate in each cortical column specific to that column's sensory experience with past coffee cups. Each of these cortical columns has a different representation of coffee cup, yet they all work together to construct a generalized idea. This is the brain's allocentric object definition, meaning objects are defined with respect only to themselves. Your brain builds up a library of allocentric objects by interacting with the world through behavior. Humans learn object representations based on movement and collaborative sensory input over time. You don't remember every coffee cup you've ever used, but every coffee cup you've ever used has contributed to your idea of a coffee cup. The way it felt, the way it looked, even the way it smelled as it was poured full. In future episodes, we're going to discuss details about how we think this works, but for now, let's talk about some properties of layers and columns that we can use to help define this interesting new computational space. A cortical column gets feed-forward input, which comes from the direction of the senses. A layer's input can be one of at least two types, proximal or distal. Let's forget about apical for now. A layer's output is the state of its cells. The output of a layer can project to the inputs of other layers, including itself. All layer input and output can be defined in terms of SDRs. Because of the inherent properties of semantic representations with SDRs, merging and splitting of axon bundles is okay, so the data flows in this diagram can break apart or join together between layers. The layer is unaware of the context of its input. So what does all this have to do with spatial pooling and temporal memory? Well, let's say that a layer in the cortical column is running those algorithms. 
The layer would tap into the cortical columns, feed forward stream to get proximal input, and the temporal memory would get its distal contextual input from previously active cells, which provide a temporal context. I've just introduced a framework for cortical circuitry based on what we know about columns and layers in the neocortex today. In your brain, neuroscientists even have insight into how the layers within a cortical column are wired. Here is a commonly repeated circuit. A layer processes proximal sensory input while its modulatory distal input comes from elsewhere. This lower layer performs spatial pooling and temporal memory as defined in previous episodes to create a representation that merges sensation with some modulatory signal, creating unique and comparable representations. The layer's output is proximal input for another layer, higher in the cortical column, which we call a pooling layer. The pooling layer creates a stable representation of something being projected from the input sensory layer over time. This circuit could be used to process sensations occurring at locations in space on an object being sensed. A location on an object can be represented in a distal input signal in an SDR. This signal could be created in another layer of the cortical column, and we'll talk about ways it could be generated in future episodes. The pooling layer's representation can be split and projected into adjacent layers in neighboring columns as well as itself. This layer uses neighboring cortical columns object representations as a context for its own representation, sharing perception across many cortical columns. You might be asking yourself how that location signal is being generated in that lower layer. I'll have some answers for this in future episodes, but first we're going to need to talk about grid cells in the next episode. Thanks for watching, and as always, if you like this episode, please click the like button below and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you won't miss anything in the future.